Once Farben's Nazis bought enough votes to entrench themselves in power, they made well on their election promises to their employers. Beginning with joint Nazi IG Farben synthetic oil and rubber ventures in 1930-33, that Hitler's war machine self-sufficient. The cooperation continued with the plunder of Europe's chemical industries. As the Nazis invaded each country, IG would take control of the chemi chemical companies. If these hostile takeovers were good for business, slavery was even better. Instead of work rather than phrases, many of the camps had work will set you free on their gates. It was the greatest false advertising campaign in human history, unless you define free as dead from an exhaustion. As the war dragged on, IG created its own private camp called Monowitz, also known as Auschwitz III. Monowitz was located right outside the largest synthetic oil and rubber factory in the world, the largest industrial complex outside the borders of the German Reich, and IG's largest factory, IG Auschwitz. IG Farben owned 100% of IG Auschwitz. The site had been chosen by IG for the abundant water and coal in the area, not to mention all the free slave labor from Auschwitz I and II. IG created Monowitz because too many of their employees would die while marching to work every day from Auschwitz I and Auschwitz II. The slaves at IG Auschwitz were quickly worked to death. It wasn't slave labor, it was death labor. IG Farben even made a killing off killing. Zyklon B, Cyclon B in German, was the name of the gas that the Nazis used to kill off scapegoats not lucky enough to be selected for death labor. Zyklon B was sold by Deitch, a company owned mostly by IG Farben. Deitch profits doubled as a result of its Zyklon B sales. They even saved money removing the now superfluous warning odor. Various IG gases were tested on Auschwitz prisoners. Various IG pharmaceuticals were too. Most died from the experiments themselves. Others were eliminated due to concerns of a proprietary nature. Bayer was at the head of the IG Farben drug testing program. One of the SS doctors at Auschwitz, Dr. Helmut Wetter, a longtime Bayer employee, was involved in the testing of Bayer experimental vaccines and medicines on inmates. He was later executed for giving inmates fatal injections. Bayer would constantly send new preparations to try out on prisoners and argue over the cost of Ukrainian women as if they were lab mice. In a number of documents only recently discovered exists a letter in which Bayer sales director Wilhelm Mann praised famous Nazi Dr. Joseph Mengele's experiments and promised to discuss financing from the company. I have enclosed the first check, Mann wrote. Dr. Mengele's, ex Mengele's experiments should as we both agreed, be pursued. Heil Hitler, Mengele wrote to his bosses at Bayer headquarters. I have thrown myself into my work wholeheartedly, especially as I have the opportunity to test our new preparations. I feel like I am in paradise. In 1948, a small minority of the IG Farben directors, all the eyewitnesses, were found guilty at Nuremberg of mass murder, enslavement, and plunder, including Fritz Termier. Because of pressure from right-wing legislators in the United States who felt the real en enemy was communism, not German businessmen, they were all out of jail within four years. Despite introducing gas warfare, forced labor, national socialism, and the Fuhrer principle, despite encouraging anti-Semitism, despite being the Nazis' biggest financial backers, they were all acquitted, acquitted of preparation and waging of aggressive warfare and conspiracy. The court ruled that there was not enough evidence of knowledge of the immediate result of their own actions. This, despite evidence that Farben agencies, Bayer agencies in Chile and Argentina supported financially and otherwise the establishment of local chapters of the Nazi party and the dissemination of propaganda throughout German Chambers of Commerce. Anyone who wants to understand the origins of World War II should read the links provided. It's the evidence against IG Farben, produced at Nuremberg. The truth is that there was plenty of evidence against Bayer and the rest of them, 
It's just that IG Farben was indistinguishable from and, and often in business with the biggest oil, chemical, and drug cartels in the United States. That's why they got off. Had they all been, in, been found guilty, war profiteering might have ended or at least become more difficult. As in World War I, the war trials were a sham. Cipro, made by Bayer, is the first medication specifically approved for use in the event of a biological attack. A year before 9-11, U.S. health officials approved Cipro to fight, quote, the deadly agent anthrax. Cipro was already one of the world's top-selling antibiotics. Suspiciously, the Bush cabinet was all put on Cipro on September 11, 2001 almost a month before people began dying from anthrax. One doesn't simply start taking a powerful antibiotic with no good reason. The American people are entitled to know what the White House staffers knew nine months ago, stated one truth and justice activist. Amid anthrax attacks and widespread fears of exposure, Bayer has refused to allow other pharmaceutical firms to produce Cipro so that they can sell more. Activists are now prosecuting a nationwide class action lawsuit on behalf of all persons in the U.S. who purchased or paid for Cipro, accusing Bayer of entering into unlawful agreements with Bar Laboratories and Horst, Marion Roussel, under which, in exchange for over $50 million per year, these two companies agreed not to manufacture or market a generic version. The U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson threatened to override Bayer's patent unless they agreed to lower the price of the pill which Bayer promptly agreed. Secretary Thompson ordered more than $100 million worth of Cipro from Bayer at a bargain price of $0.90 cents per tablet, when other companies offered equally effective and lower-risk substitutes for a few pennies each. And then for free? No one ever questioned the unprecedented FDA selection of this single, largely untested, extraordinarily expensive antibiotic called Cipro for anthrax. Incredibly, according to the Physician's de Desk Reference and the American Medical Association, the drug is contraindicated, a fancy term for historically bad drug effects relationship or unwise to use. It's contraindicated for conditions resulting in pneumonia, which is how anthrax kills. Consider also Cipro's listed side effects, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, dizziness, gas, headache, heartburn, lack of energy, loss of appetite, nausea, sensitivity to sunlight, stomach upset, vomiting, blurred vision, chest pain, chills, fever, hives, nightmares, restlessness, ringing in the ears, skin rash, and tremors. By January of 2002, after more than 32,000 people from Washington to Boston consumed Cipro in the wake of the anthrax mailings, thousands had become seriously ill. Many died as a result. This death toll has never been counted in assessing the damage brought about by the mailings. Many researchers have noted cannabis's reputation, mostly in African folk medicine, as an effective remedy for anthrax. The role certain cannabinoids play in general antibiotic action is more well known. Cannabis, both smoked and infused into a drink, is often used to clean out the lungs. Nobody has died, nor has anyone suffered ringing, rashes, or tremors from simply smoking cannabis. The side effects are minor and can be mitigated. Like I said, these crimes are just some of the highlights of Bayer's long history of genocidal, biocidal crimes. A more comprehensive list is provided in the info box below. And let's not for forget the medicine monopoly. <clears throat> Big drug companies like Bayer began by se selling analgesics like methadone and heroin and aspirin. Homegrown cannabis and poppies can be used to treat the day-to-day -day pain concerns without the need to pay Bayer anything. And that's a big reason why the war on drugs continues. The August-September 1946 edition of Seba Symposia, the trade magazine of Seba Pharmaceuticals, was entirely devoted to hashish. This must have been printed immediately after the end of war World War II. Well, it must have been a good deed to make up for all the years of death and destruction. For whatever reason it was printed, the cover of the magazine is quite positive suggesting some of cannabis's pleasurable 
and inspirational effects. Depicted as a plant in a hookah, and from the smoke of the hookah comes music, peacock feathers, naked dancing women, the sea, the mountains, and the cosmos. Naked dancing women. See? They know exactly what cannabis is all about. Fun, joy, appreciation, sensuality, social activity, and, in, and inspiration. Novartis, the Swiss side of the IG Farben, has a website with health information, some of it mentioning the various clinical trials being done with dronabinol at the Mayo Clinic, the University of Arizona, and in the UK. The problem with judging the whole plant medicine by observing the effects of isolated synthetic cannabinoids are many. The whole plant provides complementary cannabinoids that balance each other out. The, these cannabinoids just don't exist in the synthetics. Bayer understands this problem, which is why they went with GW, who are using whole plant medicine. They're still attempting patents on their delivery technologies and even on strains of cannabis itself. Bayer and BASF have both recently announced plans to invest heavily in agricultural biotech. The recent Aventus-Bayer merger put Bayer in the number one or number two spot on the short list of gene giants, the others being Syngenta, Dow, and DuPont, all related to Farben at one time or another. I wrote back in March of this year that if IG Pharmaceutical ever gets control of the cannabis market through patents and or inventions, no doubt the gene giants will buy them out. It seems like I was right. There's some debate between myself and super activist Matt Elrod on the likelihood of a marijuana monopoly arising from GW's plant patents. Here's an interview I did earlier this week with Ikichi Megoji, law professor at University of British Columbia, about his views on pi biopiracy. I am here at the University of British Columbia with Ikichi, a professor of law uh, and specialize, a specialist in uh, plant patent law, is that correct? Yeah, basically patent law, yeah. particularly on the issues of uh, biopiracy and um, patents on life forms. Uh, issues on biopiracy? Yes. Yes, could you explain to our viewers what biopiracy is, what you mean by that? Well, um, the, the term biopiracy is more or less a very, very um, emotive kind of um, term which uh, scholars are using to describe the appropriation of um, indigenous or traditional people's knowledge through the mechanisms of the intellectual property regimes such as you know, patents, you know, um, um, plant um, utility protection regimes, um, or even sometimes copyrights. Right, and I've noticed lately that uh, some people or some corporations, I guess, have mm -hmm. attempted to patent plants without uh, genetically modifying them. That, that means just like to patent the know-how and the plants by themselves without, without really improving them technically. Is that correct? Well, um, you know, the, 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 the issue of uh, you know, obtaining um, property rights such as patents on plants is quite, quite um, complex and you know, controversial. Uh, the more pertinent question is why is it that you know, some people, particularly corporations, are able to, uh, to, to, to gain property rights over certain plants which more or less baffle the ordinary person having of course regard to the fact that some of the plants in question have been known to other people in terms of what they could be used for. So it's not really their fault as much as it's a function of the loopholes in the uh, in the in the relevant laws that you know guide folks who want to get uh, property rights over plants. So they are basically trying to exploit you know the gaps in the laws 